Hello and welcome to the Posture Dojo. My name is Sam Miller. I'll be your host on this postural transformation journey, sharing stories from my own healing journey of an 85 degree kyphoscoliosis and speaking with experts from a variety of fields, some more predictable and some more surprising. Today, I'm excited to be speak, speaking with Dr. Christy Ennis, who is a physical therapist who works a lot with the fascia, the pelvis, as well as strength and conditioning. I sense a lot of overlap in things that are important to somebody embarking on a partial transformation journey. Dr. Christy, please welcome to the podcast. Please share a little Thank bit you. how you ended up doing what you do. So I had a significant injury when I was a kid. I shattered my ankle in a diving accident, thankfully jumping actually, not diving. And I was told that I would never run again, I'd probably not walk normally again. And I was in years of intensive physical therapy and I really think that it was my physical therapist that enabled me to be able to complete two Ironman races. And so she was so inspiring to me and I absolutely just love moving. That's what I decided I wanted to go into. Amazing. So you became a physical therapist and then did you find everything you needed there or what areas have you added on to your original training that you've seen, you felt a lot of benefit in? Yeah. So actually my undergraduate degree is in nutrition. So I do tend to utilize that a lot in everything that I do. I'm also a certified strength and conditioning specialist. So it goes hand in hand with obviously injury and prevention, right? Is the physical therapy and, and then working on that strength and mobility component along with the nutrition gives you that whole package. So I, I use pretty much everything every day. There you go. So a more holistic approach, bringing in yes, aspects absolutely. that yeah, that you might not think a lot of people who are dealing with back pain or especially what I'm focused on, which is those structurally, com those structural compromises, the kyphosis and the scoliosis. There's a lot of other factors that we might not think, oh, that are related. And so that's why I think on social media, you'll see a lot of these kind of specific posture stretches and things that, that we know aren't. It's a very superficial approach. What are some common kind of misconceptions that you're seeing float or floating around on, right now on social media, things that you'd like to clear up? Because there's a lot of information. You can argue a point either way online these days and find information to, to take you either way. So how do you navigate that? And what kind of big misconceptions are you overcoming in, in your space right now? Boy, so that's a loaded question, isn't it? Everybody is so different. We're just going to start with that. I, I give people a lot of credit because we all do what we can do to try to make things as general as possible, right? So that people can hopefully get some benefit. And that's it all encompassing, right? Hopefully most people out there are trying to help. Not everybody, right? Um, so I guess we'd have two different worlds, the physical therapy and almost nutrition world, right? So I think right now what a lot of people are trying to do from a nutrition standpoint is say, oh my goodness, you need vitamin X, right? Whether it's vitamin B, B12, B8, excuse me, B8, there's no B8, vitamin B12, B2, vitamin D. And what people aren't realizing, again, we'll go back to that holistic thing, is that so many of these vitamins and minerals and nutrients actually work together to do what they need to do, that by just taking a B vitamin isn't going to solve whatever issue it is that you have, because again, they work in conjunction with all of these other things. Bones are a big one. So for example, calcium, people will take a calcium supplement, right? Which is great, but calcium is a carrier. So you need boron, you need manganese, you need all of those things for the calcium to actually get into the bones. So just calcium alone doesn't actually help. So I see that a lot from a nutrition standpoint. From an exercise standpoint, I think again, there's a lot of emphasis on let's do as much as possible, as fast as possible and work as hard all the time as you can. So what we really know about kind of building strength is that you do need to work until fatigue. Okay. That's different for every person. And that can actually be achieved in a variety of ways, whether it's body weight, whether it's dumbbells, whether it's bands, there is no one way. I think that's really what I see. There's no one way that it has to be done as long as, like I said, you're actually working to that component of fatigue. And by fatigue, I don't mean like you can't move, but it would be like you get to that last repetition and you go, whew, like I got good form still, but that's really going to be hard to do that weight again for another one or two repetitions. So that's, I think those would probably be the biggest things. 
Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And sometimes we ebb and flow in the different kind of trends to do it. Right now, when it comes mm -hmm. to the exercise part, I'm seeing Mike Mensa's philosophy of just super slow, lower volume of sets, but just very slow, hypertrophic kind of movements are coming back into trend. And then again, on the nutritional side, I'm seeing these kind of all-in-one supplements are a bit of a trend right now as well. The ones that come with the Shilajit and the CMOS and trying to combine as many of these supplements into one. And don't get so, me wrong. It's not that there's no value to those, right? I, I think in general there is, but you can't necessarily replace a good exercise training habit in a good diet, right? It's good to supplement. That's what it should be as a supplement. It shouldn't replace. Let's dive into a layer which is really, I'd say over the last kind of year or two, I've been moving it up the ladder in terms of importance in, in how I approach postural correction. And, and really I'm realizing that there's so much that, so a lot of progress that I was attempting was being limited because I wasn't paying attention to this fascial web all over mm -hmm. our bodies, yeah. from our tongue to our fingers, to our toes, it's everywhere. And it really, seems to respond and cluster and clump and compensate. It seems to be that web that's holding our muscles and our bones in a certain pattern. And if we're attempting to build healthier, more flowy patterns in our body, then the fascia really d does need to be addressed. A hundred percent, 110 <laughs> percent, if we can go above a hundred percent. Fascia is both involved structure and strength and also movement, which is what makes it pretty remarkable. And it literally connects the whole body. And you mentioned it being over muscles, bones, but it lies over organs. Right? We have thicker collections in different parts of the body. And even in pain, you'll see different receptors start to form as our bodies change and we start to not move as well. Like the thoracolumbar fascia, which is that big fascia, right? In, the, in that low to mid back, will actually start to change in how it perceives touch and pressure. So it's a really pretty fascinating, all-encompassing system. So how do you work with fascia with your clients? Yeah, and you probably already tell people this too, but the number one thing I say that has nothing to do with exercise is hydration. The more hydrated you are, the better those layers, right? That fascia, I always use the description of a raw chicken breast and you see that white filmy chi um, uh, skin over that raw chicken breast. That's a good description or at least a visual of what fascia looks like. And that can just get stuck and adhered. And if it gets stuck in one place, it can affect the entire limb from front or back side. We're made up of so much water that if you are not hydrated, those layers get stuck in and of itself. No matter how good you are about moving and diet and all other diet stuff without the hydration, you're in trouble. And it doesn't have to just be plain water. If you can see, I'm drinking my little bubbly. This is not a plug for bubbly, but I just some some sparkly water, no, no sugar or whatever, any of that stuff in it. Secondly, I think it is also very important that we move frequently in small patterns throughout the day, but through, like I said, that whole system. So I'll, I always use bicep curl because that's easy, right? So just doing a bicep curl, there's nothing wrong with a bicep curl, works the bicep, right? Works some of those, the muscles, the fascia, the tendons, the ligaments. But when we're either sitting in a car all day or sitting hunched over our desk all day, we start to get fascia tightness here, actually even in the foot, right? That's where that's truly the base of our system. So if we're doing that for eight hours a day, four hours a day, just doing a, and I love yoga, but just doing a 10 minute yoga session or an hour yoga session isn't going to fix it. So I really love my patients and clients to do small doses of things throughout the day. And that, like I said, involving the whole body. I have a derma edge that I created that I'll go through the whole body from an exercise standpoint, motion standpoint. I like combining leg arm, head, all of that together and just quick little segments that you can do at your desk or if you stand up and take a break to do that as well. So that's a key component, I think, is keep things hydrated, keep things moving and those layers gliding with that fluid. Amazing, yes, because if that fascia is getting stuck or if it's getting clustered or clumped, you're not going to get that same flow of hydration of water through that area. So when you are doing this, this fascial releasing as well, Drinking a, uh, probably maybe an extra amount of water during those during and after those periods is going to be good to make sure that you're you're rehydrating as necessary, right? And then I guess I liked what you said about integrating into what they're already doing. I'm at a standing desk right now and I have one of these balls. This is great for going at from the feet feet up as well. Perfect. 
because it will actually split into two domes, which is also some, it adds some variability and then it also allows me to just to move through a more irregular environment, which I think our bodies were originally designed to do. Yes. And actually that's the reason, you can't see it, but I'm sitting on this chair and you can probably see me moving. It's a rocking chair that you can rock this way, you can rock this way, and actually I'll tilt it a little bit. Like, so throughout the day, sorry, I don't mean to make anybody dizzy, but throughout the day I'll do some hip flexor stretches and some side movement like this, right? So I actually think if you do have to be sitting or in, a, in one position, it's good to have something that enables you to move and, and glide a little bit. Amazing. Okay, so we know the importance of fascia and releasing that and getting any obstacles and tensions out of the way as we're rehabilitating and building our kind of our best or our unique ideal kind of body and posture. How important is the pelvis in all this? So again, I'm going back to that whole holistic thing. You can't tease one part away from another. So if you look at the pelvis, it's literally in the center, right? What I think a lot of people don't realize is how much tension actually gets held in the pelvis. We often think about our shoulders and our neck because we can feel that, we can see it, right? Like it's pretty obvious when your shoulders are up in your ears <laughs> and you poke at it and you go, whoa. Where the pelvis comes into play, pelvic floor muscles actually attach into the spine. There's some deep hip muscles that attach there too. So all of those things that help keep us stable, keep us balanced from side to side, those get tight really easily. So you, it's e not easy to know, but if you have tension in, in, in more than one area in your body, odds are you'll have tension in that pelvic floor too. If you have to sit with kind of your legs displayed out, that's another indication that there's tension in there. And actually, so by helping to release some of that muscular tension, that fascial tension, you help the hips, you help the spine, again, obviously helping that posture too. So just from a muscle tightness, fascia tightness, I think it plays a role. I mean, it does. And technically, our pelvic floor is considered part of our core, right? Again, think about where it sits. So it's important, just like every other muscle in the body, that we balance that, that ability to contract at the right time, that's key, and the ability to actually let go. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great, perfect benchmark is just getting to that awareness, right, of being able to mm -hmm. activate and let go and having that awareness. There's the psoas is one of the most common ones. I even spoke to someone today who was having issues with that. The psoas obviously being, it's obviously threaded through the, the pelvis from the upper lower back to the back of your upper legs. There's the psoas is very integrated in that area. I think you said something really important is that you can't see that tension sometimes. So in the shoulders, you're seeing mm -hmm. it, you're seeing that, that hunch formation, but in the pelvis, you might be holding immense amount of tension and not even be aware of it. It's very true. So I actually like any of my patients that have back pain or hip pain, even if they're not coming to see me from a pelvic standpoint necessarily, to do that supine butterfly pose. And I tend to use the word soften as they're breathing and breathing through the diaphragm is very important to help calm that nervous system down, help relax that whole system. And that just tends to open up that whole area. And that leads some awareness for people so that next time they're walking around, they know what it feels like now to maybe feel a little bit more relaxed. And if they're walking and they go, oh, hey, wait a minute, soften, it helps them to then down train those muscles a little bit once you get that feel. Soften a thought which sends a program and instruction through our brain stem and nervous system all the way down right. to our pelvic floor, our psoas uh, region. This is, this is something that I would wish to be very like very mainstream and understood in layman terms. I think that was probably one of the big things holding me back from those early teenage years, sorry, later teenage years, when I had a lot of things that I could have been doing, but I wasn't doing them because it wasn't really common knowledge for me. It was a lot of anatomical terms that were out of my reach, and it's only really been as I'm diving into this last six years that I've started, okay, anterior, posterior, pelvic tilt, and the core, so ass. Like, there's a lot of anatomy that we need to dive into here, dive in here to start, I think, visualizing better. And so we imagine softening, and that happens in our body. How it, we talked about how the member, the extra layer of skin on the chicken breast is a handy way of looking at the fascia. Are there any ways that you help people visualize what's going on around the pelvis and the hips? So again, it depends on if we're talking about internal or external, right? It's a cheesy one, but I often use the petals of a flower kind of opening, right? Because almost everybody can picture that. And that is literally what we're trying to do. We're trying to 
to spread and open. So that one tends to work pretty well for people, actually both internally and external, to be honest with you. And soften, like I said, those are the, the two key ones that I use. Interesting. Okay. And so what, because we can't see this tension, what you mentioned one where if you're sitting down and you're naturally displaying your legs instead of having your knit, knit, like legs straight yeah. out in front of you, are there any other indicators that you might be like, yeah. okay, there, there might be some hidden tension in your pelvis? Definitely. Definitely. So again, one of the other things I said was if you have areas of multiple tension, if you have numerous areas, if you're constipated, that's a very, those muscles need to relax fully to let everything out, urine and feces, right? Pain with any type of, for a female, pain with penetration, whether it be sex or whether it be a gynecological exam, that type of thing. Men tend to have deep abdominal, women can too, but men tend to have that deep abdominal pain that goes along with it. So those would probably be the most common. And obviously, again, if you've got hip tightness, back tightness, that's another indication too. For sure. That's a really important one. It took me back to early, actually where I started this second chapter of my life, figuring out what's going on at a deeper level. I lived with pretty, a very severe kyphoscoliosis until about 33 when my body started shutting down. My life force was being choked out and I hadn't mm. really pieced it together that it was this compression that was happening from that imbalance higher up and the, the bracing, the internal natural bracing that my body was doing to hold this mm. imbalance structure higher up. I went in with symptoms of acid reflux and constipation. And obviously the doctor was like, oh, well, I, it might be IBS, right? Irritable bowel syndrome and prescribed me antibiotics. And it, it just felt off. I didn't, I know I've always been very hesitant to take antibiotics. So I delayed and delayed on that as I went on this eight month search to figure out how to truly release that area and restore flow. Because that constipation, that acid reflux was a byproduct of, of tightness, internal chronic core tightness around, around, the, around the hips and that region. And it was a tightness that I'd been holding for so long and is also so deep that you can't visually see it with an untrained eye either. It's, I believe that there are many people with IBS and acid reflux that might be being prescribed like antacids and diets for an issue that may very well be structural. At the same time though, I know you mentioned diet. I do feel like even if there is a structural component, more often than not, there is some other component from our body that also needs to be addressed. And it's always good to address everything, not from a medicine standpoint, I'm saying, but making sure that you are eating the right diet that is gonna help you relax and release, and that's inflammatory too. So I do think they do go hand in hand with each other. For sure, for sure. And as I was trying everything, I, I dialed in my diet and, and ate really well. And one, th one thing that really prolonged this like this search was I started going very raw food vegan style and it had I had so much fiber that my symptoms actually started worsening I would get more inflammation in the lower belly I was getting more more clogged up and I'm like huh it's something food related and then I went full carnivore I, that was I was at a pretty desperate point I went 30 days full carnivore just soups eggs steak some beef pretty much just animal protein only. And I felt better and I thought I'd found the solution through the diet again. So I'm like, oh, it is something to do with the diet. And, but what I think was actually happening was that because there was a lack of fiber going through the tight psoas, which is located directly next to the intestines and the digestive systems, the lymphatic system, the tight psoas had actually been compressing and choking out that flow. I, the, me going at it from the nutritional standpoint kept me on these detours when, at least from my issue, it was, it was very structural. And by structural in that area, it's, it can be very, it can be emotional and also psychological, whether we're holding chronic tension, chronic protection, or the, even just the physical bracing of imbalances higher up. We just don't want to negate, this is your story, and it's an important and valid story, For but sure. you also have to keep in mind all of the other people that are probably not doing so great on their diet. So I, I do really, I'm still going to stick with my guns on that and say that I think both aspects are very immensely important and that you really need to investigate all avenues depending on what's going on. Because even if somebody had similar symptoms to you, it doesn't necessarily mean that their story is going to be the exact same story as your story. 
right? So what worked for you 100%. is phenomenal, and you did such a good job of figuring that out. But I also don't want to negate some of the other things that might be helpful for some other people on their journey too. For sure, yes. This is only my story, and it's it's only if someone is perhaps experiencing one of these things and they're recognizing maybe through some of these tips that there might be some some deep core tension being held obstructing the flow of the digestive system it may be something to consider as well what so let's set someone on the right path nutritionally where do you lie in that nutritional landscape right now i think we all make it a lot more complicated than it truly needs to be you just want to stick as close to nature as you can i'm not saying this is easy i'm saying it's simple <laughs> not easy right fruits vegetables some good protein there's debate of course about what type of grain if any and it depends on different countries too right i'm sure you've noticed that yourself well. so i think if you just stick as simple to nature as you possibly can you're going to be best off and I, most people even though i know you, your fiber was affecting you certainly but most people in general don't eat enough vegetables I'm going to say vegetables before fruit, certainly. And there's lots of research on that too. Right, so I yeah. personally subscribe to 80-20, 90-20, where I try to eat as much as I can. That's really, really from the earth as best as I can. But I also, I'm going to be honest here. I love nachos and I love pizza and I love cheeseburgers and I love cupcakes. And I'm not willing to give those things up in my life. If you can generally eat in a good way, it's also still part of normal, healthy eating to enjoy and, and treat yourself to. I'm very on board with that. If you get 80%, <laughs> 90% dialed in, balanced, integrated, yeah, as close to nature as possible, as close, as far away from more of the, the artificially created stuff. I think you're on the right track there. Definitely agree with that. And yes, I do integrate fiber and, and vegetables into my diet. Now, during that time, it did. It, it was an interesting kind of step on, on my journey. But yeah, I, I, my mm. ideal is that 80% dialed in, also being ready for anything to be able to have some fun in life as well. Yes, and it, and it, it can yeah, all be fun. That is not you an can easy make task, the eighty percent but... <laughs> fun too. Yeah, yeah. You can. You so, can. Amazing. Although I, I'll be honest, it's challenging sometimes. So it, it can be. It can be. So sometimes we need uh, assistance from people who have blazed that trail. So how are you currently working with people? Who is your uh, ideal person that you're working with, and how are you working with them? Where can they find you? So I do have an inpatient practice, but I do a lot online. I tend to work with men and women, 50 plus is generally my age range, that have had some sort of injury that sidetracked them and they're really missing the things in life that they love to do, but they're concerned about not just getting back into it, but people telling them they can't do it or maybe trying to get back into it and not doing it in a safe way and re-injuring themselves. So that's the my ideal person that I work with and who I work with a lot. Amazing. And where can they find you? Oh, yeah, sorry. So I do a lot on YouTube. My YouTube channel is Dr. Christy Ennis. My website is drchristyennis.com. And I have a membership through there so that people can work with me individually as well. That's probably the easiest place to find me. Amazing. Okay. Thank you very much, Christy. We'll include those links thank in the you. description. I thank you for doing the work that you're doing and, and guiding people through, through the noise to common sense, good practices, and helping people re rehabilitate quality of life. So we can spend more time doing what absolutely. we love to do. Love it. Yes, absolutely. You're on the same page for sure. <laughs> All right. Yes. All right. Thank you, Christy. And thank you for tuning thank you, thank in. You. We'll see you in the next one.